Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our first virtual summer solstice. And on behalf of the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture, it's my pleasure to welcome our next segment in which we will take a virtual field trip to the famous Stonehenge World Heritage Site. And we're delighted to present this segment in collaboration with English Heritage, which is an organization that cares for more than 400 historic palaces across England. You can probably tell I'm English myself and I first visited Stonehenge when I was a child and the stones felt absolutely enormous. And as we know, many times when we go back to a place as an adult, somehow things don't feel the same. But when I went back a few years ago to take my daughter, I was amazed to find the stones just as enormous, just as magical and just as magnificent as they felt when I was a child, even with the crowds. So I was super excited that we're able to bring you um, and to Stonehenge and to visit them as part of our summer solstice festival. And today we're welcoming Susan Greeney and Heather Sabir from English Heritage, and they're going to introduce us to Stonehenge and talk about its links to the summer solstice. Heather Sabir is Senior Property Curator for Stonehenge, and she is responsible for the conservation of this important site, as well as leading its visitor operations. And she's an archaeologist by training and studies prehistoric monuments made with large stones, uh, dating back to the Neolithic period. She's published many journal papers and several books on aspects of archaeology and heritage management. And she has prepared a special video for us. So please take a look. Hello, everyone. My name is Heather Sabir, and I'm the senior curator here at Stonehenge for English Heritage. And it's wonderful to be joining uh, in with the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture uh, on your virtual summer solstice celebration. As I'm sure you know, English, uh, here at English Heritage, we're also having a virtual celebration this year, and we're going to be live streaming the midsummer sunrise because unfortunately we still can't welcome people to come in uh, in the sort of numbers that they normally do. So as curator here, I have been coming down through the lockdown uh, to check on the site uh, because um, one of my jobs is to check the conservation. And so it's given me the opportunity to walk through and make a little film so I can point out to you some of the features that prove to us that Stonehenge was built to reflect the uh, midsummer sunrise at the solstice, at the midsummer solstice, and the midwinter sunset on the midwinter solstice. So I'm walking now past the heel stone, which is one of the outliers of the circle itself. We're not sure why it was called the heel stone. It may be after the Greek god Helios or because it's at, uh, at a bit of an angle. And we know through excavations in the 1970s that it had a partner stone. And I'm now walking on that northeastern, southwestern axis. I'm walking uh, to what in effect would be towards the southwest. Um, following the line that the sun rises along on the summer solstice at sunrise and we're fairly sure that it would have come up through the heel stone uh, and its partner and then you can see there's a stone in front of me which is called the slaughter stone we're absolutely sure well we're almost sure that there was no slaughtering at Stonehenge or human sacrifice um, it was called that by antiquarians because of the geology. Um, some of the solution holes are quite red when uh, there's been water on them and it's iron leaching out of the stone itself. We're fairly sure this stone would have had a partner as well. You can see there's a, a bit of a bump in front of me in the ground. So the sun would have gone right through these two stones as well, leading up to the entrance of the Great Stone Circle. And I'm just going to walk through, walk towards what we think is the entrance to the stone circle and then I'll turn around so you can see where the sun would have been rising, will, will be rising uh, in a few days on the midsummer sunrise. In front of me are the huge Sarton stones that form the outer circle 
Uh, these are quite amazing because they have actually been worked and, uh, and they have these lintels on the top and it all fits together architecturally. There are mortise and tenon joints and sort of tog, toggle, sort of almost like tongue and groove joints uh, that hold the lintels on. And this is a very dense sandstone called sarsen that came um, from, we think, from the Marlborough Downs about 20 miles away. And you can just see a smaller stone starting to appear. That's the other main geology at Stonehenge. There are smaller stones called blue stones. This, again, that's an antiquarian term. They were called blue stones by the antiquarians. They do look quite blue when they're very wet, but um, they are rhyolites and various other geologies. Uh, but we know um, academics have found the quarries where these stones were coming from in southwest Wales, which is over 200 miles away. Now you can just see a stone appearing uh, at the back. I'm just coming through the entrance. A very tall stone and you can still see the tenon joint on the top of it. Uh, because inside the stone circle, and you might be able to hear a change in the acoustics as well. Inside the stone circle was a huge horseshoe of trilithons and these are the classic shape of Stonehenge. The two uprights with the lintel uh, and trilithon literally means three stones. Unfortunately the tallest one, which is just in front of me, its partner stone uh, wasn't up to the job really. It, we think it probably fell in antiquity into three pieces. And the lintel um, looks as if it possibly wasn't completely finished. Whether it ever made it onto the top and then collapsed as well, we're not quite sure. But the sun rise, we go right through on this axis and just to the, to the left as we're looking at it of this tall stone which we know is Stone 56. So I'm looking back down towards the northeastern horizon and I hope you can see there are two blue stones that are slightly lit up by the sun today and the huge outer circle with its uh, orthostats and lintels just in front and then in the distance the heel stone and on the morning of the midsummer solstice sunrise the sun appears in the horizon and appears to rise up through what would have been the hillstone and its partner and then two other stones, the slaughter stone and its partner, right through the entrance here to the centre of the circle where I'm now standing. Wow, wasn't that brilliant? It felt like we were there. Thanks so much Heather and we really appreciate your kind video message. It's now my pleasure to welcome Susan Greeny. She is the Senior Properties Historian at English Heritage. Trained as an archaeologist, she specializes in the study of British prehistory, particularly moments from the Neolithic and Bronze Ages. At Stonehenge, she develops content for visitors, including exhibitions. And in addition, in her spare time, she is a PhD candidate at Cardiff University, undertaking research into Neolithic monument complexes. In 2019, she was also named as a BBC New Generation thinker. Thanks for being with us, Susan. And after her presentation, we will have a live Q&A session with her and she'll be connecting with us directly from England. Thank you, Jane, for that introduction. It's lovely to be with you for your celebrations. I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction to Stonehenge now and take you through some slides that show how Stonehenge aligns with the solstice. As Jane said, uh, English Heritage is, is a charity and we look after over 400 historic monuments and sites across England. And these range from Roman forts to castles to royal palaces. But of course, the most famous site that we look after is Stonehenge. This is the familiar view of Stonehenge that you may have seen in books and on the internet and on the news. Um, this is a really lovely photograph that was taken for us a few years ago, which really clearly shows not only the stone circle in the middle of the site, but also the henge, the henge of Stonehenge, which is that earthwork, the circle that you can see all the way around the outside. And that's actually a really significant part of the monument, but most people are familiar with those stones in the middle. Now, Stonehenge was built in the late Neolithic period, which is about four and a half thousand years ago. And it was built to align with the movements of the sun. So this is the really the only clue that we have about how Stonehenge was used and what its purpose was. 
because when archaeologists have excavated at Stonehenge, they haven't found that many objects. There isn't lots of pottery, tons of animal bones or evidence for burning that might help us understand what went on there. So all we really have are the stones and the way that the stones are laid out to help us understand the site. Now, just for those who aren't familiar, this is a location map that shows you where Stonehenge lies. It's about two hours drive uh, away from London, and it's actually part of a two part World Heritage Site known as the Stonehenge and Avebury World Heritage Site. And it's in Wiltshire in southern England. Stonehenge is a really significant site for us. Um, it's one of the oldest sites that we look after, but it's also the one that receives the most visitors. We get over 1.5 million people a year come to have a look at Stonehenge. And one of the most significant times of the year for us, those of us who help manage the site, is the summer solstice, when we, for the last 25 years or so, have allowed people to come into the middle of the stone circle to witness the sunrise on the longest day. Now, Stonehenge is quite a complicated monument, so I'll just give you a brief overview of how the different phases of the site work. As I said, it was built in around four and a half thousand years ago, and that's the date when the stones were put up in the middle. But the earliest part of Stonehenge is that earthwork around it, the henge. So here's a little visual that shows you what that henge looked like when it was first constructed in about 3000 BC. And at that time, there was a ring of stones just inside the bank. We call them now the Aubrey holes, the holes that they stood in, because they were discovered by a man called John Aubrey in the 18th century. But there were 56 standing pillars that stood inside the henge and this circular earthwork monument. And this was used for about 300, 400 years as a place of cremation, so where people buried their cremated dead. And we think that an estimated 150 people were buried at Stonehenge during this first early phase. Later, the stones were put up in the middle of the site into the familiar lintelled stone circle that we can see. And this is what makes Stonehenge really unique. It's one of many stone circles in the British Isles, but it's the only one to have horizontal stones, the lintels, on top of the upright stones. And it's also the only one where the stones have been worked and shaped to such a degree. So some really careful engineering went into constructing Stonehenge. As you can see by this phase, the pillars have been removed from the Aubrey holes and the stones have been put up in the middle and some outlying stones have been put up, some of which are quite important and we'll come back to later. In the third phase of Stonehenge, you can see just down at the bottom right of this picture that the avenue is built, which is the processional approach to Stonehenge, so the main entrance. And there are some small changes to the way that the blue stones, the smaller stones, are laid out in the middle of the site. Now, who built Stonehenge? What was life like at the time that it was constructed? This is a visualisation of a settlement at a place called Durrington Walls, which is about a mile and a half away from Stonehenge itself. A few years ago, about 15 years ago, we couldn't really answer who built Stonehenge and where they lived, but now we actually know. There's some excavations that have been taking place at this site, and this uh, visualisation shows you some of the houses and some of the monuments that have been discovered there. And we think this settlement is where the builders or the users of Stonehenge lived in around about two and a half thousand BC. As you can see, it's quite a cluster of little houses with all kinds of things going on. And in fact, it may have been even much larger than this. And the evidence shows us that people were gathering at this place, particularly at the time of solstices and particularly at winter solstice. So this was a place where people were coming to from all over the country to help take part perhaps in building Stonehenge or in taking part in solstice celebrations. But of course, Stonehenge is most famous for the summer solstice, and that's what we're talking about today. Now, to show you a little bit more about how Stonehenge is precisely aligned on the movements of the sun, I'm going to show you a little video, which is using a website called the Stonehenge Skyscape. Right, okay, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a virtual tour of Stonehenge now. This is a website called the Stonehenge Skyscape website, which we launched last year. And what it shows you is um, a view of Stonehenge. It's actually based on a webcam that's based around about 100 metres away from the stone circle. And it takes a photograph of the sky every three minutes. So this is what the weather is doing in the UK at the moment, quite a nice day. 
Um, and that skyscape, that, that picture of the sky is projected onto a static version of the stones. So we can use this to have a little bit of an explore. Um, we're stood right in the middle of Stonehenge at the moment. And we're looking in this position towards the northeast. And this part here, you can see, this is the outer Sarsen circle. Sarsens are the really large stones at Stonehenge, which were brought from about 20 miles away. And this is the most complete section of the outer stone circle. But as we, as we pan round, you can see that the stone circle is not complete all the way round. In fact, at the back here, there's lots of stones missing. So what would have been 30 uprights and 30 lintels uh, is now sadly depleted. Within that, we have what we call the Sarsen horseshoe, which is made up of five trilithons. And when I say trilithon, I mean two uprights and one horizontal stone, as you see here. So we have trilithon number one, number two. Number three is the trilithon that stands at the head of the horseshoe, but as you can see, it's partly fallen down. So the upright has fallen towards us here and its lintel can be seen, its horizontal st stone is lying in front of us, which would have originally stood on top here. Trilithon number four, and then trilithon number five. This one again, half of it has fallen down and you can see that the upright and the lintel has fallen and is in front of us here. Between the Sarsen circle and the Sarsen horseshoe is a ring of blue stones. These are the much smaller stones. These are the ones that were brought from the Preseli Hills in southwest Wales, about 150 miles away. And within the horseshoe, there's another ring of these stones. These ones are much more pillar, much more elegant shaped. Um, but they were all bought from Wales. So that's the main layout. And what we're doing here is we're looking towards the northeast. And in the distance there, you can just about make out uh, a standing single stone. It's actually a very large stone. It looks small from here. Uh, it's known as the heel stone. And that stone marks the rising sun on midsummer morning. So if you were stood here um, and looking at this view, um, please do come back and have a look at the website uh, tomorrow when you'll be able to see it or later tonight. Um, you'll be able to see the sun rising over the heel stone just in this direction. If I pan down, I can show you the compass. So you can see here we're looking directly towards the northeast. The sun actually rises slightly to the left of, the sto of this stone. And in prehistory, kind of four and a half thousand years ago, it would have risen even more, about a solar diameter further to the left. And what we think is that there may have been a partner to the heel stone. Excavations a few years ago found um, a, a position of a stone standing here. And it may have been that the sun rose between the two paired stones. What the sun does at the opposite end of Stonehenge on the shortest day of the year, so in six months time at midwinter, the sun actually sets and descends here. And it sets between the two stones of the tallest trilithon. Unfortunately, of course, the effect is lost today because half of this has fallen. But the sun would set down a very narrow rectangular slot. You can see how carefully the prehistoric people have worked and shaped the stones to frame this solstice axis. And the sun would set down here. And it would actually descend down into where this area, which is where the altar stone is. You might be able to just make out a lying stone underneath these fallen ones. That's a different type of stone to all the other stones on the site. And it's known as the altar stone for obvious reasons. So if I switch to the skyscape view, we can actually see that mapped out quite clearly. So I've got an arrow here that shows you the direction of the midwinter sunset. And you can also see in the sky that we've marked up the passages of the moon and the sun and the main planets. So um, here you can see actually the winter arc of the sun. So we have very short days in the middle of winter. The sun rises here and it sets here. But this shaded area shows you the full difference between winter and summer solstice. So here you can see that the summer solstice, the sun rises just over the heel stone and then we're pretty similar to where we are today. We're nearly at noon here, just past noon, and then sets right over in this direction. So a completely different arc. So you can see the massive difference between winter and summer solstice and how Stonehenge was really carefully arranged to reflect the movements of the sun on those two days. So you've had a really good insight into how the stones of Stonehenge were lined up with the movements of the sun. This here is a photograph that um, was taken a couple of years ago on the 20th of June. Now the solstice itself 
means a standstill. So the sun actually comes to a standstill where it moves across the horizon. So for a few days, either side of solstice, you actually get a pretty good impression of what the actual solstice looks like. And this photograph was taken on 20th of June back in 2017. And you might be able to spot a little camera down in the bottom corner. That's a sky at night photographer who was taking a photograph of the morning sunrise. And you can just about see faint glow over the heel stone on the outside of the stone circle, which shows you where the sun is rising at midsummer morning. Now, this is quite unusual to have absolutely no people within the stone circle at solstice, because of course, normally we, we open it up to the public and there are thousands of people all standing amongst the stones to try and get a glimpse of this sunrise. It's not just the stones at Stonehenge that are aligned with the solstice. The first section of the avenue is also aligned. So in this picture, you can see some excavations taking place, which happened in 2015. And you might just be able to make out some brown spludges on either side of the heel stone. Those are the ditches of the avenue. And you can just about make out that they continue as earthworks on the other side of the road and down below in the foreground. That's the processional approach to Stonehenge. It's, it's a leading way up to the main entrance. And that first straight section of the avenue is also aligned on that crucial solstice axis. So the people who built Stonehenge were really carefully aligning both the stones and some of the earthworks on the summer sunrise. Here we're looking at a view of Stonehenge for, again from outside the stone circle and we're looking directly along the solstice axis. So you might be able to just see in the far distance there the heel stone just poking through between some of the stones. And you can see how carefully shaped and vertically shaped those two stones are in the middle, the one with the knob on the top, the tallest one, which was part of the, the trilithon that stood at the head of the horseshoe. And you can see how carefully the whole site was arranged around that solstice axis. You can also tell from this view just how many stones are now missing from Stonehenge. This is the back view, but you can see that there are quite a few of the outer stone circle stones now completely missing. Some of them have fallen over and some of them have been eroded, but we think a lot of them were also broken up for road stone and taken away in the medieval period. This is a view of what the summer solstice looks like in a normal year. Lots of people gathered at Stonehenge. People come to celebrate the solstice for all kinds of reasons. Some people come because they have a spiritual connection to the site and they want to come and um, have that personal experience. Some families come just because it's a great time to get up close to the stones when you can't normally. Other people come just to watch the spectacle and have a good time. So it's quite a, a variety of people that come and a, a varied crowd that we get. But over the last few years, we've been working quite hard to make it a family friendly and a really peaceful experience for everybody. Now, of course, Stonehenge isn't just aligned with the summer solstice. We saw it in the skyscape film that's also aligned with the winter solstice. And we can't really show you that visualization because of course the stones are now partly fallen. But this is a little photograph that shows the video that we have in our visitor center at Stonehenge in the exhibition, where we have a 360 degree film of what it's like to stand within Stonehenge. And we've tried to give an impression of what it would be like at the midwinter solstice when the sun sets between those two tallest stones at the head of the horseshoe. Unfortunately, it's a, a, a vision that is lost to us today because of the stones that have fallen down. Now, what did solstice mean for the people who lived in the late Neolithic period? And why on earth did they go to all this effort to build such an mo enormous monument, which enshrined all these movements to the sun? Now, these people were farmers. They had domestic animals. They had pigs and cows. They had crops. And of course, the changing seasons and uh, the, the patterns of sowing and harvesting would have been really, really important to them. So. Certainly they were marking the solstice, both the winter solstice and the summer solstice as important times in the year when the seasons were changing and when the calendar was turning. But Stonehenge isn't just a calendar, there's much more to it than that. The people who built Stonehenge did so probably for religious purposes. We don't really know what those were. We don't know if the sun was seen as a deity or a god, for example, or it may be that people thought that marking the, the particular times of the year, these solstice events were times when things were a bit uncertain and they had to undertake certain rituals and certain ceremonies to make sure the year continued to turn and moved on in the same way as it should do. So we can only really guess as to exactly what the beliefs of late Neolithic people were, but certainly the winter and the summer solstice would have been 
important times of the year, times for celebration, times when you come together with other people and times for religious ceremonies. This is a picture that we created a few years ago to give an impression of the kind of food and feasting that might have taken place at solstice gatherings at Stonehenge. We know that the people who lived at Durrington Wars were gathering there, particularly in the middle of winter, and they were feasting on enormous quantities of food, a lot of pig, um, some cattle bones were found, but also other foods. We know that the pots, for example, were used for making uh, cheese or some kind of yogurt from, from milk. So people were having really big parties and big celebrations. And if you think about how we have Christmas celebrations now and, and a little bit at summer too, it's a good time to get together with friends and family and celebrate. And this is an idea of what uh, Stonehenge may have looked like when it was first completed and when people were visiting together for the winter solstice. Stonehenge itself is actually really small, so we don't really know who was allowed into the center of the monument, who were the people who were special enough to witness that sunrise and that sunset. But perhaps it means that there were leaders or priests of some kind who were the special people who got to go within the stone circle, whereas most other people might have had to stay outside. So finally, just to say that solstice this year at Stonehenge is going to be a little bit different. We are unfortunately able to open up the stone circle as we normally do. But what we've decided to do instead is live stream the summer solstice. So if you go to our English Heritage Facebook page and also any of our other social media streams, you'll be able to watch live the, the sunset and the sunrise. I think the sunrise itself is about 11 p.m. your time. So if you want to log on to our Facebook page and you'll be able to see sunrise from the middle of Stonehenge live streamed for the very first time. Thank you. everyone. Susan, that was such a great presentation. And we're now in the live Q&A part of this um, little section of the summer solstice celebration. And so just want to encourage everyone to um, send in your questions via Facebook and YouTube. I have someone who's going to feed them to me so that um, uh, we can get some of your questions as well. But of course, Susan, I have to start, even though I'm here in the US, I am actually British. And the question that always comes to me is, am I actually related to the people that built Stonehenge? Oh, well, it's about 85 generations ago. So you're talking your great times, 85 grandparents, if you were. And of course, the British Isles is famous for having so many invasions of different people. We have the Romans and we have Anglo-Saxons. There are lots and lots of later migrations into the British Isles from all over the place. So you might be slightly related, but maybe only a tiny little part of yourself. <laughs> okay, yeah. I do remember learning all about Celts and Romans and everything when I was at school. Um, but presumably, um, they must have found um, Stonehenge interesting too. So do we have any evidence like for what the Romans might have thought about Stonehenge or the Celts or other folk? Romans are really interesting. So um, archaeologists have often found quite a lot of Roman objects at Stonehenge. So um, bits of brooches, coins, bits of pottery. And people have often thought that these were kind of left by tourists just having picnics and you know visiting the site like we do today. Um, but a few years ago, there were some excavations and they actually found a big Roman pit had been dug inside the stone circle. So actually, maybe the Romans were having a bit more of an active role at Stonehenge and maybe even treating it a bit like a shrine or visiting it with some kind of religious purpose. So it's, it's a bit unknown, but they may have treated it a bit like some sort of shrine or temple. Later on, we know that the Anglo-Saxons used it as a burial place. There was a, a man who was buried in the middle of Stonehenge who had been decapitated. So there's an idea that maybe he was a criminal. Maybe this was a place that was a bit on the edge, a bit different and scary. Somewhere you might place somebody who wanted to be kind of outside of society. So there's hints that it was used as an execution place. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, now I'm thinking of Roman tourists and then Anglo-Saxon executions. That's sort of interesting. Well, neither. Well, I guess we still have the tourists, right, but not so much on the execution front. Hopefully not. <laughs> so we've got a few questions. One, I think probably um, Chloe sent in and she says, I've heard that there are people buried at Stonehenge. And do those burials have anything to do with the summer or winter solstice uh, at Stonehenge? Yes, Chloe, you're right. There are lots of burials at Stonehenge and they come from the early period of the site. So before they put the stones up in those familiar formations in the middle, there was that early phase. And that's when people buried their cremated dead at Stonehenge. And we think probably about 150 people were buried there in that early phase. Um, 
what's really interesting is that these were men and women and children and um, some recent work has shown that they traveled to or they weren't necessarily local to Stonehenge so they weren't living in the immediate area they may well have come from uh, Wales or the southwest of England or perhaps further north and perhaps been brought there as cremations to be buried so we're just beginning to find out a little bit more about those cremation burials um, only in kind of science develops and we can do kind of new tests and new techniques on cremated bones but yes Stonehenge was a place of burial in that early phase wow there's nothing really relating them to the solstice um there is a cluster of cremations which are found just down in the south of the site and people have suggested that maybe that cluster actually re relates to the moon to the movements of the moon oh. um so there may there's hints that maybe in that early phase the sun might not have been so important but the moon was so there may have been an interesting shift in how people um had their religious beliefs or the way that they viewed the skies yeah oh that's interesting i never really thought about the moon and stonehenge so so there's sort of a bit of a connection there as well as with the sun there might be it's really difficult to tell for sure but there's this cluster of cremations in a particular southeast part of the site and that is at the major standstill of the moon so kind of like the solstice but for the moon and um there's also a hint that there's some posts in the entrance way people have suggested they might line up with the movements of the moon um and the station stones which are the four stones that form a kind of rectangle around stonehenge they're aligned on the the summer solstice axis but the long sides of those rectangles also mark out that the moon movement so we're not sure but there might have been some kind of interest in the moon too wow oh that's good to know well um so here's some another question um from bailey and he asked why did they form the stones in arches oh yeah get good to crack. okay so you might have seen in my video that i showed how um the winter solstice in particular is is lined up with one of those arches um the trilathons we call them in the center of the, the circle but there are five trilathons and then also they created the outer circle with arches as well and we don't really know stonehenge is the only stone circle in the world that we know of that has lintels that has those horizontal stones so um there may well have been timber monuments in the neolithic that were built to look similar in fact the joints that were used to connect the stones together are, are really woodworking joints so perhaps of course those have rotten, rotted away so we don't have the evidence other than post holes in the ground but maybe Stonehenge is a kind of version of a timber monument that existed at that time too. Ah okay well that's good to know and I, I guess another question that sometimes people have is why don't you put them back you know there's the fallen stones although that would be quite the task I would imagine. Yeah, it, it would be quite the task. Yeah. So um, restoration has happened at Stonehenge. So back in the 1960s, for example, and the late 1950s, um, in fact, one whole trilithon fell over in 1797 and was put back up in 1958. Um, but what we have taken a decision at Stonehenge is that we have the earliest accurate plan um, and that dates from 1740. Um, and at the moment, Stonehenge looked pretty much like it did in 1740. To put back up any of the other stones, we're kind of guessing as to what Stonehenge looked like because we don't have an accurate plan. Yeah. Um, and it's sort of making it not a ruin anymore. So Stonehenge as a ruin was painted by Turner and painted by Constable. One of its attractions is that it's incredibly old and you can see that in the shapes of the stones and the way they've fallen down. So if we restored it all and made it look pristine, it wouldn't be quite the same monument. And we don't quite know when those stones fell down. So some of them might have fallen down during the construction. We don't know if actually Stonehenge was ever completed in the way that we might think. So we'd be kind of making it up. So it's it's much better just to kind of leave it as it is, as a ruin. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, so another question from Leslie, uh, is there any truth to the idea that the blue stones make sounds and Stonehenge could also have been an instrument? Yeah, that's an interesting idea that some people have suggested. So the, the blue stones where they came from in, in Wales, about 150 miles away, um, there are some stones there known as ringing stones. And in fact, some of the place names, the Welsh place names mean ringing stones. And if you strike them with a hammer, they make a kind of nice resounding ringing sound. Wow. Now, some people have suggested that if we 
hit the stones at Stonehenge, they might create some kind of ringing stones, perhaps it's some sort of xylophone. Um, but um, we don't really want to go around bashing our stones, they're quite precious to us. <laughs> um, there have been some small experiments where we've put kind of layers of kind of protective um, material down and, and done small taps, um, but it's not really been conclusive. So um, we don't know if they were used in that way, uh, but it's a possibility, it's a possibility. Yeah, wow, that would be quite the thing to, you'd have to hit it pretty hard, I would think. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so probably not a good idea, especially as we were just talking about whether or not we should put the stones back up or not. Um, so um, how long have people celebrated solstice at Stonehenge? I mean, do you think it was pretty continuous or, you know, from when it was first built? Really interesting. Um, I think it probably hasn't been continuous. We know obviously that the monument was built like that, but we've got not many indications that the Romans or anybody later on understood that there was a solstice alignment right up until the 1720s when um, an antiquary and a surveyor called William Stukeley first noticed that Stonehenge was aligned on the summer sunrise. And he wrote about it and he published it in his book. Um, but it wasn't really until about 150 years later in the Victorian period that people started to come and actually try and watch the sunrise from Stonehenge. We know there was a lecture given in 1860, for example, when people started to get interested in this question and started to attend. Um, and as um, bicycles became more common and then later on cars, people came to witness the spectacle and it became quite an event. We actually have a record of several thousand people at the end of the uh, 19th century. So this is, you know, it's quite a, a number of people gathering already. Throughout the 20th century, more and more people have come. We know that in the 70s, 1970s and early 1980s, there was a huge music festival. The Stonehenge Free Festival happened in the fields around Stonehenge. We at English Heritage have, have managed it and run it in the way that it is now since 2000. So that's the managed open access that we currently run, which is allowing people to come within the stone circle um, for sunrise um, on, the, on the longest day. Right. Well, some more questions have come in. Um, and so from Marilyn, who says, I'm a horse lover. And she said, did the people, I assume that built Stonehenge, have horses? Um, and if they did, what did they do? do or what did horses do for them did they have horses they didn't have horses sadly no. the first uh, domesticated horses and um, there were wild horses in the british isles prior to that but the first domesticated horses probably come in just afterwards in the early bronze age um, so the people the neolithic people who built stonehenge probably didn't have horses but they did have cattle that they could have used for traction for plowing um, and potentially they could have used cattle to move some of the stones it's it's quite conceivable you could um, get several oxen together and use their power to pull the stones although experiments have shown that they're not particularly accurate and that the kind of careful movement of stones and right raising them into position would definitely have been done by humans right wow that's quite the thought um so from um mark we have how is Stonehenge related to other stone circles? Because there are many in Britain. There are a lot of stone circles. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so some other stone circles in the British Isles have some alignment with the solstice. There's one up in the Lake District, for example, called Castlerig, very famous stone circle, very beautiful location. And um, that has an outlying stone, a bit like the heel stone at Stonehenge, and it seems to be lined up with the solstice. And there's a cluster of stone circles in that part of the Lake District and up into the southern part of Scotland that have some sort of alignment. And this might also be the case in Ireland, where, of course, there are much more famous monuments from the Neolithic, which line up with the sun. You may have heard of Newgrange, which is a great big burial tomb. That one is lined up with the winter solstice and wow. quite a number of passage tombs, these graves and passage tombs where they're burying their dead in Ireland, are lined up with the winter solstice, the summer solstice, and some of them with the equinoxes as well. So there's a tradition in the earlier part of the Neolithic of burying the dead in Ireland and it also in, in North Wales and in Scotland with monuments that were built to align with the sun. But Stonehenge is, is about 500 years or so later than those monuments. So it's a slightly different um, setup. It's a bit of a, it's quite a late stone circle, Stonehenge. It's right at the end of the Stone Age. Ah, uh, okay. All right. Well, so we only have like a minute left. Um, so I'm, um, there's a question for Wakan. 
who says, I'm wondering, would you guys preserve the stones from erosion and other damages? And if so, how? So that's really back a little bit into that area of whether you would um, change, you know, rebuild Stonehenge, so to speak. And your, your question, I might be thinking of uh, similar sites, for example, in Malta, where they actually have put their temples um, underneath kind of large tents to protect them. Oh, yes. Which uh, we have an archaeological site at the Peabody that we work in where they've done that too. Yeah. Oh, okay. So something quite similar. Yeah. So we're quite lucky because Stonehenge is built of a the big stones are built of something called sarsen, which is incredibly hard. And we know that it's been there for four and a half thousand years. And we're pretty sure that it's safe and it's not weathering too much and it's not eroding too much. And it would change the site so much to try and protect it. It doesn't really need it. Um, and what we do is really carefully manage how many people can go inside the stone circle. So solstice is really the one occasion that people can get in amongst the stones. The rest of the year, visitors have to stay a fairly kind of restricted distance away from the stones. And we only let people in um, before we open to the public. Um, um, solstice um, is a sort of different day to the rest of the year. So we work quite hard to try and protect it stones the carvings on the stones and um the uh the archaeology under the ground is also quite fragile so we we, we try and keep it as safe as possible but at the moment we don't need to stick a tent up <laughs> okay that's good well we've run out of time susan so i want to thank you so much for joining us um for our event it's been really great wonderful to learn all about stonehenge and to hear directly from you this um the sort of i guess it's noon here in the states and late afternoon for you um in britain